disappointed in your own grin, and need one that's a million times more shit-eating? Now you can wear a shirt that says, while I may have something in my teeth, the handsome man on my shirt doesn't. Or do you need multiple colors of shit-eating? We've got you covered there too. But if you don't want my slightly deceptive looking face covering your chest, we also got one that's just a logo. Significantly less shit eating on that one. Pick up yours now at zazzle.com slash the cinema snob. Well, that was fast. I mentioned that I'd spotlight some films considered to be the worst, and two episodes in, I'm stuck with an Ed Wood film. Wood, in case you didn't know, is often called the worst director of all time. And I'm inclined to agree, not because I've actually seen any of his films, but because I'm told that I'm supposed to hate him. One of his most notorious films, in a filmography of nothing but notorious films, is Glenn or Glenda, a 1953 docudrama produced by George Weiss, who commissioned a low-budget exploitation film to capitalize on Christine Jorgensen, one of the first major cases in sex reassignment surgery. Writer-director Ed Wood was hired as a director due to his own transvestism, and with Wood starring in the title role of Glenn or Glenda, the film not only serves as a pseudo-biographical film, but is also very progressive for the time, with its themes dealing in pro-tolerance of the trans community. It's also batshit fucking insane! Told in a very non-linear fashion, the film's narrative jumps all over the place, at times having a narrator, and at other times having a strung-out Bella Lugosi playing a scientist who talks about... Um... I don't know what he's talking about, but it has nothing to do with the movie. While Wood's contribution to the film was certainly genuine, the producer pushed the more taboo aspects of the movie in marketing it to drive-in teenage audiences, especially with posters that emphasize the movie deals in sex. Big lettered sex twice on the poster, followed by an exclamation point. I'm not sure if that's Glenn or Glenda, so I'm just gonna guess it's Salon Kitty. I'm sure there's a lot you can say about a movie that you can watch for free on its own Wikipedia article, so let's dive into the amazing world of Edward D. Wood Jr. <laughs> Bella Lugosi in what? Am I supposed to come up with the title myself? Like it's movie Mad Libs? Alright, uh, Verb, uh, Meets, Place, Brooklyn, uh, Noun, Gorilla. What? Bella Lugosi meets a Brooklyn Gorilla? Of course that's a real thing! So it's Bella Lugosi in Glenn or Glenda? We don't know which, but his penis is in one of the two. It also features Tommy Haynes, if that really is your name, just like it could be Bud Schelling. What's with no one settling on a name in this movie? And why does it look like evil spirits are roaming in the background? Maybe it'll all be answered here, in the making of this film, which deals with a strange and curious subject, no punches have been pulled. It, look, I've seen Myra Breckenridge. Sometimes it's okay to pull punches. This is a picture of stark realism, taking no sides but giving you all the facts, all the facts as they are today. I'm not here for facts, damn it. I'm here for alternative facts. Now tell me how Glenn or Glenda is going to try raping me in the bathroom. But remember, you are society. Judge ye not. Well, okay. I won't judge you for displaying anal beads on the corner of the screen for some reason. The movie itself better not be judgy either. <laughs> Well, the music seems to be judging him. I just met him. Why is the soundtrack telling me to be scared? And when is he going to sell me some Count Chocula? Man's constant groping of things unknown. 
Uh, yeah, whatever. Just teach me how to do the time warp again. If you're expecting any of this to make sense, it's okay. You'll be distracted by the lightning cutaways. But most are not new to the signs of the ages. Hey, you mind keeping it down with the lightning effects? We're trying to tell a story here. Plus, he's just gotten his chemistry set from The Sims. Huh. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Oh. I don't know what you're making, but as long as you keep that skull there, I'm not drinking it. Perhaps he's inventing Febreze. It'll take care of the odor coming from that one skull that still has some rotting flesh on it. Oh my god, he drank the potion and he's huge now! People. All going somewhere. All with their own thoughts. Ugh, peeping Tom much? Just witness a murder already. Jimmy Stewart would have gotten extra weird in Rear Window if a murderer didn't show up. Right now, the scientist is looking to yell at Woody Allen on behalf of his mother from New York Stories. If you're wondering where the Bela Lugosi scenes are going, don't ask him. I'm pretty sure in one scene he gets distracted by a fly on the wall. I want to know the size of the dragon that he thinks he's looking at. We now see the sad case of Patrick, who committed suicide over being arrested for wearing women's clothing. They've got the right person to investigate this. I'm pretty sure Inspector J. Edgar Hoover knows what he's doing. He goes to see a Dr. Alton, played by the film's other narrator, Timothy Farrell. Inspector Warren is left confused and rattled by this newest case. Perhaps the doctor can help. From policeman to inspector, 20 years of it. <laughs> I guess I've seen everything there is for a policeman to see. Yet I wonder if we ever stop learning. If you're that distraught over finding a guy in a dress, thank God you weren't present on the Black Dahlia crime scene. Maybe it's the cigar and the hair and the suit, but I keep feeling like Inspector Warren is part of the Mafia. The inspector wonders what could have been done to prevent the suicide, and then Dr. Alton goes into story mode. You're referring to the suicide of the transvestite? If that's the word you men of medical science use for a man who wears woman's clothing, yes. Yes, in cold, technical language, that's the word. Well, hang on. First use it in a sentence, and if no one complains to you on Tumblr, then it's okay. Dr. Alton has his own issues. He's secretly wondering how he can become a horse. Until then, he'll just keep wearing those ties. And he'll get extra serious when he tells us about Glenn or Glenda. I'd like to hear the story to the fullest. Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. What are you looking at me for? I'm not going to write your story for you. And don't you know that having a reading that dramatic needs to be followed by lightning? And then God created a narrative. I certainly hope so. This movie needs one! A young man, though, is... speaks the words of the all-wise. What the hell is he talking about? Oh, so much for that narrative. I guess God rested on this day. The story... is... begun. When they said inject some electricity into this movie, they didn't simply mean lightning cutaways. Newspapers all over the country are shocked about sex changes and cross-dressing. Hard to believe how times have changed. Yeah, yeah, there's the whole bathroom issue, but that's clearly nothing compared to whether or not Bob Revere can put up his Christmas lights. We get some flashbacks talking about how fear of progress has always existed in the world's dumbest people. Airplanes. Huh. Why, it's against the Creator's will. If the Creator wanted us to fly, he'd have given us wings. Whoever is saying that shouldn't leave the house, because I'm pretty sure they choked to death on air. And did that plane just take a shit? Automobiles? Bad. 
they scare the hosses. If the creator had meant for us to roll around the countryside, we'd have been born with wheels. Well, I guess having brains didn't make the scarecrow much smarter after all. It's okay, though. They have the Lord on their side. If the creator had meant us to be boys, we certainly would have been born boys. If the creator had meant us to be born girls, we certainly would have been born girls. You know, by that logic, technically, we shouldn't be wearing clothes at all. The hardest part for Glenda is all the people on the street who keep confusing him for Mamie Van Doren. The movie specifies that Glenn isn't gay and that he has a fiancé named Barbara who he hasn't told yet that he likes to wear women's clothing. Those fingernails have got to go. You know, I didn't realize they're as long as they are. My goodness, they're almost as long as mine. Maybe even prettier. Oh, the fire hasn't gone out of this relationship. Tomorrow they're going to spend the day talking about the rough patch of skin on their elbows. Before we get too carried away, we need a little vignette to tell us just how uncomfortable men's clothing is. Tell me about it. And get the hat. Better still, get the receding hairline. Men's hats are so tight they cut off the blood flow to the head, thus cutting off the growth of hair. Thank you, Proto Mr. Blackwell. This narration got catty. And what's with this guy hanging out in Purgatory's bus stop? Women's clothing may seem comfortable at first, but you may change your mind after trying to wear a pencil skirt. The movie has to go further back in time for reasons so they can show off their costume budget. Just for comparison, let's go native. Um, let's not. Is it not so that it's the male who is the fancy one? Could it be that the male was meant to attract the attention of the female? What's so wrong about that? Well, I think he's about to rape that girl, so I can think of one thing wrong there. And did they not know enough black women that they got some white girl to play one of the tribe's women? The most ironic thing about this is that Glenn looks a little bit like Ted Cruz. And we all know that he's secretly the guy in all those creepy Easter Bunny outfits. Oh, we're not done with the flashbacks yet. Time to know what Glenn's childhood was like. Sister, let me borrow her dress. You want to borrow your sister's dress? What for? I want to wear it to the Halloween party. There are names for boys who go around wearing girls' clothes. The biggest shock is that as a child, Glenn was a coat rack. They talk about how Glenn loved dressing up as a woman on Halloween, but got caught when dressing up after Halloween. to the pillar of salt, well, one look at Glenda, you'll turn into a water cooler. Glenn's sister doesn't know what to think of this, but the narration certainly does. Would you be surprised rough, tough individual was wearing pink satin undies under his rough exterior clothing? <clears throat> Thank you for that mental image. If that worker is wearing anything like that, it's definitely going to have a skid mark on it. The film does mark the historic moment in World War II when soldiers planted a flag on a judge's head. I think more of Glenn and Barbara's hot, burning chemistry will heat this movie up. It's been a long day. Have you seen the paper yet? No one. Isn't that a strange case? Yes, the case of the missing film frames. If God wanted frames to be missing from the film, he would have storyboarded it that way. Oh, now let me just keep reading my paper. Our fourth term in psychology explains a lot of the facts, but I'm afraid the end of study is only the beginning of reality. Honey, would you mind not waxing poetic when I'm trying to read The Born Loser? These two can't even go on a date without her starting a long-winded story. Once, long ago, just after we started going steady together, we promised we'd never lie to each other. Are we going to start now, just because we're engaged to be married? Darling, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Please lay off the Valium. But don't take whatever drugs the editors of this film are on. Hold the string! Hold the string! A mistake is made. So, did someone get your order of buffalo wings wrong? The fuck was that about? 
Can someone please say something relevant to this story? Should he tell Barbara of his Glenda now, before the wedding, or hit her between the eyes with it after? God damn it, 1950s, stop punching women in the eyes! Just communicate with them! I think Glenn's biggest problem is that there seems to be only one clothing store in this town, and it may be located in the center of hell. You can see how sheer the material really is. The God of Thunder is advising you to not ejaculate in your pants when buying clothes. That's awkward no matter what you're buying. Sometimes I can't tell if the narrator exists on its own, or if it's the voice of inanimate objects. How can a guy be normal and go and do a thing like that to himself? All the same, it must take a lot of guts to pull a stunt like that. That's a problem I don't ever intend to face. Those bars of steel were molded together in a different time. We can't blame the lava for having a slightly bigoted nature. It progressed a bit more and at least accepted dance when Jennifer Beals and Flashdance took over the steel mill. Now Glenn is confessing that he's not sure why he turned his kitchen into a bar slash laundry room. Perhaps his friend Johnny will lend him an ear. I have to tell her. But when? Before or after? I think you know the answer to that one yourself. Well, first you're going to have to tell her that you broke her favorite toothpick. Now for another story within the story within a story. Johnny makes Glenn feel better by telling him about how he accidentally smothered a giant chicken by sitting on it. Oh, and he also wears women's clothes like Glenn. The little woman came home unexpectedly an hour early. Oh, that's the look of a woman who is looking for any excuse to get divorced. Johnny is a very selfish lover. As annoying as it gets when the narrator comes back, at least I can follow along with his thoughts, unlike the scientist creating a recipe for crystal meth. This is their life. To take it away from them might do as great a harm as taking away an arm or a leg. Oh, believe me, I know how great my arms look in a dress. What? There's some things you have to wear women's clothing for. It severely cuts down on the small talk with the mailman, especially when I need to bend over to pick up a letter I dropped. But Glenn is finally working up the courage to tell Barbara. Glenn, what's the matter? Huh? All of a sudden you seem a thousand miles off. He's having trouble breaking it to her that she's actually a robot. Maybe he should tap out and have the narrator explain things. Be fair. Be fair. Be fair of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. Okay, never mind. Bella is talking to his imaginary friend, Puff the Magic Dragon. He eats little boys. What? What are you talking about? There's no cannibalism in this film, and there's certainly no children being eaten. Do you need to report a crime that you witnessed? I would say it gets less weird when it cuts away from Bella, but it really doesn't. Oh, right. This is the day they all accidentally drank from Bella's coffee cup. Oh, and a giant tree fell on the lead actress. Now Glenn turns into his superhero alter ego, Wall Street Man. Soon we see a wedding scene. Don't know how this could get weird. What's so weird about that? I'm sure Satan has a best friend, so naturally he'd want to be that person's best man. Better hurry this wedding up. The devil's got to get back to singing about 1994 and the apple. 
Once this movie comes down off of whatever high it's on, maybe we can get back to the story. Do you eat little boys? Puppy duck tails and big fat snails? Why is eating snails on the same level as eating children? Now it would be interesting to just simply imagine what Bella is thinking about, but why just imagine it when the movie can show you? The film comes to a gigantic halt to feature sexy vignettes awkwardly spliced into the film. These scenes were added by producer Weiss to make the film longer and had nothing to do with Ed Wood, but it's no more out of place than the rest of the movie. Weird how a movie about cross-dressing stops dead to show us nothing but sexy women. See, this is why you need professionals to get the pipes out of your basement. You might tie yourself to one on accident. And does this movie need to deliver a ransom note or something? What the hell is going on? <laughs> Grandma, why were girls' slumber parties so weird back in your time? For the love of God, Bella, get a cup of coffee so this sequence can end and we can get back to the normal dose of confusing. Isn't he supposed to be a scientist? What is he inventing? A drug that'll make you hallucinate rape in front of you? This better be leading somewhere. Oh good, now that he's sobered up, even he doesn't know what that sequence was all about. <laughs> Can we get back to this movie being normal? I'm a girl. Okay, well, the movie's never gonna be normal, but at least it's back to being weird within its own narrative. Why is this turning into the last scene from Maniac? Did Ed Wood murder all these people and now their spirits are haunting him? I can't say I regret seeing the burlesque show production of The Elephant Man, but I didn't cry nearly as much in the David Lynch version. If I'm guessing right, she is secretly Satan, and according to the chalkboard, he's being taught about boats and trees and everything nice. That's not what created the Powerpuff Girls. I see the screenwriter is having the same nervous breakdown as Pia Zadora from The Lonely Lady. Stop inviting transparent hands into your head. That's what causes writer's block and gets you to say lines like this. Beware. Beware of the big green dragon that sits on your doorstep. He eats little boys. It didn't make any sense when Bela Lugosi said it, and it makes even less sense with Satan saying it. No one is threatening to eat little boys. All right, once upon a time, this was about Glenn coming clean to his fiance. Glenn has decided to tell Barbara of his dual personality. To tell her of the nighties and negligees, the sweaters and skirts. We needed the ending from Last House on Dead End Street to help us come up with this conclusion. Is he gonna tell her he also doesn't eat children, even though she didn't ask? <laughs> on the plus side, Glenn, telling her the truth, gave her an orgasm so epic that it caused an orchestra in her pants. She accepts him by offering her her top, and he gets to break it to her about size differences. Is that the end of the story? Not quite. I'll get back to it in a minute. And what was the look on the inspector's face when Dr. Alton decided to talk about bondage for ten minutes? Even though the story of Glenn or Glenda is over, the movie goes on for 16 more minutes so they can tell us the story of Alan or Ann. But to enlighten you a little further, there's the second story. That of an extremely advanced case. Let's call this person Alan, Ann. I don't care! The movie's called Glenn or Glenda, and that part is over! We're done here! The story of Alan is that he's a man who soon transforms into a woman. He enjoyed doing the woman's work around the house. Alan was becoming a woman and didn't realize it. A woman in mind only, but the mind rules. Ugh, he likes cleaning. Clearly a girl. I don't mind a house covered in cat shit and cobwebs, because I'm a man, damn it! 
This part of the movie is significantly shorter, so it had better get to its point fast. Mm, I think I know the story of Alan or Anne. It's a movie that likes dressing up like war stock footage. Alan's story is so riveting it barely shows it. Instead, Dr. Alton just tells us about it. While he was in an army hospital recuperating from a wound he had received in New Guinea, he learned a very interesting fact. He learned that foreign doctors were doing marvelous work with a sex change. Yes, but it's 1950s science. They shoved raw turkey breast in his chest. I really don't recommend that. Unfortunately, this is all happening when Anne has a major toothache. Or, to put it another way... Then comes the major surgery. The removal of the man and the formation of the woman. And then you have to start working as Bela Lugosi's male servant, as willed by God himself. The road to becoming a woman doesn't end with surgery, though. Alan, at all his life, acted the part of the woman. Now he is that woman and must learn how it's done. After 1,000 repeat viewings of what women want, Anne now thinks she's gotten it all down. And now creepy guys on the street are way more inclined to check out your ass. Has the inspector gotten the point yet? Then you believe that the Glenn of the first story should have the sex change? In Glenn's case, no. No, indeed. Glenn would never be happy with a sex change. Sir, shouldn't you be investigating that suicide from earlier? Now we get to see Dr. Alton tell Glenn and Barbara the exact same story about Alan. Almost like we didn't need the inspector here. Anne was a pseudo-hermaphrodite. Even though one of the sexes was imperfect, she had the organs and the characteristics of both the male and female. I just saw you tell this story. Mix it up by giving Glenn some questionable advice. Then you think I can kill this second character? by transferring her qualities to Barbara. Exactly. It's up to you, Barbara. You must take the place, give the love, and accept the facts that Glenda has always accepted. Mm, that all sounds difficult. I'm gonna keep wearing minks whenever I want. So even though it's a movie about tolerance, by the end, it's all about getting Glenn to change for his fiance. I love Glenn. I'll do everything I can to make him happy. Except anal. And what's the advice that got him to ward off women's clothing? Glenda begins to disappear forever from Glenn. Glenn has found his mother, his little sister, his wife, and his Glenda all in one lovely package. That is not a happy conclusion. He just fucked that guy up royal. His marriage is now incestuous. Good, we can wrap things up. If this is the end of the movie, why is he still reading from the beginning of that book? Okay, it's the last line of the movie, so time to know what the moral of the story is. Oh, snips and snails and puppy duck tails. The fuck does that mean? Did you just ask him to come up with random words off the top of his head? Now I know what the moral is. The moral of the story is that Reefer Madness was right. Drugs are bad. Or the point of the movie was to make it so confusing that you wouldn't have time to be offended by men dressing in women's clothing. You'll be too busy wondering why Bella Lugosi is infatuated with snails, dragons, puppy dog tails, or whatever, to even care about how Ed Wood looks in heels. The film had a limited release and was often shown with different titles, such as I Led Two Lives or I Changed My Sex, but gained a cult following after a 1982 re-release when the Golden Turkey Awards cited Wood as the worst director of all time and critics such as Leonard Maltin calling it one of the worst movies ever made. The movie continues to be referenced in popular cinema, such as the biopic Ed Wood or in Seed of Chucky, where Chucky and Tiffany don't know whether to name their genitalist offspring, Glenn or Glenda. But as in all cases like this, we need to check in with our resident cinema er snob, my twin brother Jordan B. Matthews, to find out if Glenn or Glenda was really that bad.
The homophobic nature of the era's bygone catastrophe and the stylings of intellectual vampirism on part of science versus nature gives Glenn or Glenda the distinct flair of intelligence in pertaining to the conversation of happiness over acceptance versus persecution. Mm, yes, I see what you mean. It is rare to see a 1950s film as progressive as Glenn or Glenda, despite its random nature. <laughs> right again, as always. <sighs> Moistical. What the fuck? Weren't you bald last time I saw you? Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash stonedgremlinproductions. Follow us on Twitter at The Cinema Snob, or check out our homepage at thecinemasnob.com. And you guessed correctly, I am a little drunk. <laughs>